Last week we talked about pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. There is a helper. Jesus says, I go and I will send a helper to you. That helper will be of the same essence that I am. I speak the words of the Father. He will speak the words of the Father to you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will empower you. He will lead you. He will convict you. He will protect you as you move forward in ministry. Here's the question that should be raised from the, from the, from the understanding that there's going to be a helper. If there's going to be a helper, that means we must have an enemy. If there's going to be protection, there must be some danger. So today I want to talk about the doctrine of the enemy. He is the ch uh, chief character in the Bible. The main chief characters in the Bible is God the Father, the Spirit, the Son. And then past that, I would say Satan, the devil, is the next main character in your Bible. In your Old Testament, there's only about 10 mentionings of the devil. He's kind of a, a shadowy figure in the Old Testament. But when you get to the New Testament and you put all the Bible together, when you talk about angels and demons and the devil and Satan, Lucifer, you have over 700 mentionings in your Bible about this angelic, both fallen and unfallen realm. This is a big theme in your Bible. We have grown up in a culture where Satan is something we put on as a costume at, at Halloween. There's horns, there's, there's forts, we make fun of it. It's almost become a fictional character, and I think Satan loves it. I think it's a great opportunity for him to lull us into a sleep to say there is not an enemy that is kind of fictional. Here's what you need to understand. Jesus talked about Satan being a real person. If you believe Jesus is a real person and you believe Jesus was the Son of God, then Satan is a real person as well. If not, then Jesus is a liar because Jesus refers to him quite often through his teachings. So when you look at Peter, when you look at Paul, when you look at John, the other gospel writers, this is a real enemy. This is a real person. The Bible says things like this, be kind toward unbelievers that they might escape the snare of the devil whom they are being held captive to do his will. The Bible says things like this, your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The Bible says that the devil is a father of lies. Where will the enemy attack? Let me give you a hint, probably where you are confident in. Your weaknesses will be attacking enough on your own self. They're your weaknesses. But when you start to think for a minute, I could never have an affair. I will never struggle with an addiction. I will never struggle with that sin. That's where he's going to attack in your life. It's where you start to think a sense of independence or security in your own morality, your own goodness, your own wisdom. He loves to attack those areas. The prophet Isaiah calls him a bright morning star. The name Lucifer means uh, angel of light. He has an historical point of rebellion in your Bible, and so therefore the Bible has a point, an origin of evil in this world. It, it's interesting when you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament gives you hints of this person. The New Testament brings it to full fruition. It's like the acorn in the Old Testament. You see an oak in the New Testament. And then when at the end of the world, in Revelation, you see a battle that's going to take place. That battle's taking place right now. You just don't see it the way we're going to see it visibly at the end of time. Now let's look at Ezekiel 28. I trust that you found that by now. Ezekiel chapter 28. The prophet here in Ezekiel is talking in this passage about the prince of Tyre. This is a real person, a real historical figure. But as you read his description of this person, his exhortation of this person, you start to realize that the prophet is really talking about someone much more powerful than a human being, much more powerful than this man, someone who is behind this person in power, someone who is empowering and leading and deceiving this person in power. Look with me at verse 12. He says, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And then it lists several precious stones. You were crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. Here's what we understand biblically about Lucifer from what Isaiah tells us, from what Ezekiel tells us, is that he was a created being by God to lead literally the worship of heaven. He was the chief worship leader. He was the chief representer 
of the glory of God in the universe. He was the most beautiful created one ever created. He was the angel of light. The reason he was so beautiful, because he was in the presence of God himself. Look at the next verse there. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the days you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. The question I have is how does someone who is righteous without sin fall into sin? How does an otherwise perfect being sin? Paul says it in one word referring to Satan and, and more directly referring to each of us, pride. Paul says the, the sin of Satan, his condemnation was his pride. Look with me at the next verse. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you, a guardian cherub, from the midst of of the stones of fire. Let me show you a few more verses. Let's look at Isaiah. You don't have to turn there. Isaiah chapter 14. I'm going to start in verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you were cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High God. Paul says the sin of Satan, the condemnation of Satan is pride. What do you think our biggest struggle is as well? Pride. Here's what pride is. I don't need God. I can do it on my own. I am independent. I am smart enough. I am moral enough. I am religious enough. I can go philosophically deep enough where I do not need these primitive teachings, I do not need this primitive leading, I get to do things my way. The number one song that's requested at funerals is, I did it my way. What a song of condemnation to us as, as finite little human beings. Uh, let me show you another verse where this pride tends to take us. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. Paul says, and he's speaking here of someone who would aspire to be an elder, a leader. He says, he must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and, and fall into the condemnation of the devil. That's why if someone comes to Christ one Sunday, we don't say, hey, I think you ought to start thinking about being an elder. Because there needs to be some time. Because what happens is when you, when I, when we get in positions of leadership or power or fame, or I'll even throw the word beauty in, we as human beings tend not to be able to handle that very well. I was thinking about just the other day, it was Michael Jackson's uh, birthday. And I was thinking, we took Michael Jackson and we made him God. And men and women have never been able to handle being considered godlike. And so whenever you have too much power, too much beauty, too much wealth, you are in the snares of what the Bible would call the condemnation of the devil. A recent convert, someone that gets in a place of leadership thinking, man, I really got my act together. Look how spiritual I am. The condemnation of the devil. Somewhere along the way, God at some point fixed the angelic realm. The Bible tells us that one-third of the angelic realm followed Satan and his pride. The other two-thirds did not. I don't understand how or why or when that worked, but I do know there's a fixation now biblically that that can no longer happen. It's not like some angels are still sitting in heaven thinking, well, maybe we should try the other side. If anything, the other side and what happened to the other side convinced the two-third side that's not the way to go. Man has proven over history that if you give us too much power, too much beauty, too much strength, that we, are, we do not make good deities. And what about his character? What about Satan's character? What does the Bible have to say about it? I'm going to read you another verse. John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus says, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has nothing to do with the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. 
The Bible says he's the adversary. He's the accuser of the brethren, Revelation teaches. He's a serpent. He's a lion. He's a dragon. He's a destroyer. The main purpose of Satan is to destroy the people of God, the truth of God, and the church of God. The main purpose of Satan, he has a target on anyone who will stand and say, thus saith the Lord. I was wanting this sermon to hurry up and come to get to next week. Next week, we're talking about heaven. Next week's going to be a great week. I wanted to get past this week because when you say, I will not bow my knees to the gods and the idols of this culture, I will bow my knee to one, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, you take a big bullseye and put it on your back, on your family's back, on your life. He is the father of lies. And the point, the main point I want you to understand this morning is you and I have an enemy. Do you spend more time thinking about your pleasure or your warfare. <laughs> I think of in the Bible, Job. Job is such an interesting story. I, sometimes I wish it wasn't in there. Because you open the book of Job, and it says that Satan came with the sons of God to the presence of God. He has permission to come before God's presence, if God grants it, and he asked a request. And then Jesus, or, or God and Jesus, are there, and God says something that just scares me. Have you considered my servant Job? I don't want God to ever say that to Satan about me. Have you considered my servant Brad? Pick someone else. Have you considered my servant Job? And here's what Satan says. Not only have I not considered him, Satan knew his name. He knew where he lived. He knew his family. He, he knew his motives, or at least what his questions of his motives were. He knew how God had blessed him. Here's what you need to understand about your enemy. He knows you. He knows things about you. Have you considered my servant Job? Oh, well, yes, of course he loves you because you blessed him. But you stop blessing me, he'll stop loving you. God calls his bluff. Great, I'll pull my blessing back. Job loses his family, his children, his family, his marriage, his home, his wealth, but he still doesn't curse God. Satan comes back, yeah, but if you touch him physically, okay, you can touch him physically, but you can't kill him. So he touches him physically. Job still doesn't curse God. It's amazing to me that nowhere in that narrative do, does Job ever mention Satan. Never talks about spiritual warfare. Has no idea what's going on, although Satan is mentioning in Job a lot. Folks, we have a real enemy who would love to destroy your marriage if you're married, your finances if you're not being a good steward, your job, your character, your reputation. Do we spend more time thinking about our pleasure or our spiritual warfare? And here's the thing, biblically, people aren't the enemy. I think what's happened in church over the decades is the non-Christians are the enemies. People aren't the enemy. The Bible says they are held captive to do the will of their father. They are captives. Jesus says, I came to set the captives what? Free. What's the job of the church? To help lead people to Jesus. It's not to fight against people who don't love Jesus. There is an enemy, and Paul says in Ephesians 6 that we, our fight is against not flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in this present darkness in the heavenly realms. The Bible actually doesn't let us see a lot of this, and I believe part of the reason is, I've said this before, I believe that men would have a fascination with the angelic realm. We would either have an undue fascination or we would start to worship. And so God just pulls the curtain back. It doesn't mean the things behind the curtain still aren't active and real. Matter of fact, I think if we saw just a piece of it, we would all just freak out. So when you look at this situation with Job, my thought's always been, well, okay, I understand God and Satan have this little conversation. Really, what's this about for Job? Here's what I see post cosmic argument with God and Satan on Job. Satan has been humiliated. God has been glorified. Job has a deep understanding of the grace and mercy in the presence of God. People around him who do not believe in Job's God are condemned. People around him who do believe in the God of Job are encouraged and exhorted more to believe in a deeper way. Here's what I know about pain. God doesn't waste it. 
God allows things to happen. He also ends things when he's ready for it to end. If you believe that God is a good God, you can have great faith in a hard situation knowing that God's in charge and God's in charge of the beginning and the end. And God's got something in this for me to grow closer to him through. And whatever those things are is really what I want to focus on as opposed to the why questions. If man is left to himself, we are driven by flesh. We always tend to go philosophical. Why do a lot of college kids get all serious and dark and inward and philosophical? Because intellect apart from God leads to a deeper inner philosophy of man. And so I've got to find in my own self truth. The problem is there's no truth in your own self. So we get more philosophical. We get more religious. Satan loves religion. The world religions that are created, um, the Bible talks about the doctrines of demons. That Satan can take a whole country, put a blinder around it for generations of people. Pray, bow, give, serve, evangelize as long as you're on the wrong path. Love spirituality. I believe Satan's greatest tool is false religion through false teachers as false Christians believe it. And God says there's one means to me, and man doesn't like that notion, so we want to create new paths. God doesn't get to dictate how you approach me. We create how you approach God. We call it religion. We come with our own hoops, and then we want everyone else to fit into our own box. God shatters the boxes. God created the box. There is one way to God the Father through my son and his death, the Lord Jesus. So I want to give you a few things here. What is... What has Satan been preoccupied for the last 20 centuries? Because I believe biblically that he's a defeated foe. I believe biblically he understands that defeat, but I also believe he's still fighting a war. What's he been up to? Let me give you a few things. Number one, I believe he is up to creating false Christians. Jesus gave a very interesting parable of the wheat and the tares. He said the wheat and the tares, the wheat symbolizing the children of God, the tares symbolizing those who are non-believers. He, he even calls them the sons of the evil one, will grow up together side by side. They will look the same. They will sound the same, but they are not the same. And one day he will separate the tares from the wheat, destroying one and elevating and glorifying the other. What that biblically means in my understanding is there are folks who proclaim to be believers who can tell you they prayed a prayer at a certain age, who walked down an aisle at a certain age, but their hearts had never been converted by the glory of God. Folks, I get asked this all the time. Why don't you have an altar call every week? First of all, New Testament doesn't tell us how to do that. Traditions do in certain churches, not New Testament. We believe that God's grace through his sovereignty calls all men anytime I open the word of God and teach it that he is moving and we are calling men and women to Jesus. Here's my concern sometimes about an altar call. It confuses people because there will be folks who walk down an aisle, pray to prayer, and their life never resembles anything of Jesus and yet they'll be lying at their funeral. Everyone says he prayed a prayer when he was eight. He's a Christian. And I think it is a deception for so many you may, I grew up in a, in, a, in a tradition, altar call every week, it, just as I am. That was the song, first verse, second verse, fourth verse, get the third. <laughs> and the pastor said, I believe two more people need to come down. Everybody's elbow, hey, my pot roast is burning, go down. <laughs> Not trying to make light of it, here's my point. God doesn't save through methods, God saves through his spirit. We've seen hundreds of folks come to Christ at Austin Ridge over the last few years. We'll have someone come to the foyer somewhere in the, one of the buildings pretty much every week, have a spiritual conversation, lead them to Christ. People are getting saved. So I believe in, in, in this parable that Jesus is saying, Peter couldn't even tell the one of the 12 that was a tear. Peter had no idea it was Judas. He says, who is it? I can't tell. They all look the same. They all sound the same. They all, they all, they all do the same things. I promise you, if the rapture happened this morning, there would probably be enough people on this campus to shut the lights out and clean up before they leave. 
And I say that with a grievous spirit. How do I know that? Because many of you have been coming to Austin Ridge. You said, I grew up in church my whole life. I never heard the gospel, and now I get it. That's why. Because you can be around it all the time, and your heart never changed. Does that make sense? So I believe one of his things that he loves to do is to create false Christians. John says they're of the world, therefore they, the world listens to them. Number two, I believe one of the great tasks of Satan in the last 20 centuries is to create false teachers. The Bible talks a lot about false teachers. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, let me read this verse to you. It says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, and that's where we are, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. They hold a husk of a form of godliness, but they punt on the veracity of the scriptures. They punt on the deity of Christ. They punt on the fact that Jesus is the only way to the Father. They will hold to a form of spirituality, but the scriptures really are more suggestive as opposed to commands. The ways of God are pretty much more to comfort you as opposed to change you and convict you. We don't talk about sin. We'll talk about we just want you to have a deeper level of joy so that your life can be happier. True joy and a happier life comes from obedience with Jesus. So we talk about the same thing here. We just think the means of getting there are different. It's following Jesus. False teachers will continue to arise. In the Old Testament on three different occasions... It says that God sends a demon to possess someone to lead them in teaching or leading others because of their own personal disobedience. Two of those times, those demon-led people had the confidence after that point to lead their countries into war without asking for the help of God. That's what the doctrine of demons is. There's a pride that I can live independent from a desperate dependence upon God. Satan's using the same arguments he's always used. Number three, I believe something else he is often up to, continuously up to, is to deceive the saint. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to God. How did Satan deceive then is the same way Satan deceives now. Did God really say he's going to question God's word? God knows that if you eat of it, you'll be like him. He's going to question God's goodness. God's holding out on you. There's more, and God doesn't want you to have it. There's a deeper spiritual enlightenment apart from this primitive obedience of God. Did God really say, surely you will not die? God is a liar. Here's what Satan does in the garden. And we're going to see this in Genesis here in a couple of weeks again. The worst thing that's ever happened to creation or you or your husband is the fact that God puts silly rules on your life and calls you to obey them. That's the worst case scenario for you. So he attacks the word of God. He attacks the love of God. And sin is really not that bad. When I have someone sitting in my office, it's one of those three things. God's really not that good. They don't say it that way. But if God was really good, then he would do this in my life, or he wouldn't do this, or why is God doing this? Or because I've gone down that path of listening to lies as opposed to truth, then I get to the point of, is sin really that bad? We always think it's bad for others, right? Is sin really that bad? You see how you go from a second glance to a woman to softcore porn to hardcore porn to going to get a sexual massage to having an escort, to having multiple affairs, to really even justifying your lifestyle the last five years because your wife, it's her fault, she doesn't love you enough. Do you understand what Satan does? There's something better. God's holding out. He's really not that good, and sin's really not that bad. Folks, do you think there's a man on this campus right now that can't be unfaithful to his wife? Satan has you in the crosshairs. Do you think there's a woman on this campus that thinks can't be duped by the love and sensitivity of another male? Satan has you in your crosshairs, in his crosshairs. Do you think there's a man or woman here that can't embezzle money if given the wrong financial circumstances and the wrong situations happen around them? You betcha. And so he loves to deceive the saint. Number four, 
to persecute the saint. Turn with me your Bibles over to 1 Peter. We're going to close in a text over there. 1 Peter. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. Chapter 5. It's a text we looked at. I did 1 Peter a while back. We looked at this text. I want to come back to it. I think over the last 20 centuries, he's also risen persecution of the saints. I'm, I'm hearing about, reading about, studying about, praying about Christians in Syria right now that are being wiped out that your media is not going to tell you about. Just being slaughtered. He loves to persecute the saints. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Peter says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. How can you, cast your anxi- How can you live a worry-free life because you humble yourself before God's power and you don't trust in your own? It's up to him to do what he wants to do. It's not up to you. Look at the next verse. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your Bible may say be alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That little, that little word there, be sober, or that little phrase, it means to be serious, to be watchful, to be alert. When you're not sober, you're not watchful. You don't know what's going on around you. When you are sober, you are alert, you're sensitive, your soul is crisp. I love watching nature channels, and I love to watch lions and tigers, like, eat things. And so, because I went to Clemson University. And so, and we love bulldogs. And so, I love when I see on the nature channel this lion, and what they do is they just wait. They're not in a hurry. They don't, it doesn't have to happen today. They'll just wait. They'll set their trap. They'll figure out the enemy. They'll study the antelope. And then when they launch on this antelope, They're going to win because they figured out all the circumstances around it. They never jump in the middle of the herd. What do they do? They go for the stray. You get a little disconnected from spending time in God every day, you're straying. You get a little disconnected from community in your church, you're straying. You don't go to church for a while, you're not in the teaching of the word, you're straying. You start to cut corners at work, you're straying. You're getting into the, the eyesight of the enemy. He always goes for the stray. That's why it's so important that you and I spend time with the word and spend time in prayer. And he says, your adversary, that word adversary, in the Greek it carries the idea of an opponent in a court of law. Revelation says he's the accuser of the brethren. And honestly, Satan doesn't have to make up stuff about you and I. He just tells the truth. (laughs) He just tells the truth. He says he's an adversary, the devil. That word devil, diabolos, means slanderer. He says he walks around, he's looking, he's prowling. He's looking for someone to devour. That word devour in the Greek literally means to swallow. It's the same word used in Hebrew when it talks about uh, Israel crossing the Red Sea and the Egyptian armies followed in and the waters of the Red Sea swallow them up. Same word. He's not going to be in a rush, but he will completely devour you. He says he's a roaring lion. It literally means in the Greek he howls. It's the hunger of a large wild beast. It says he prowls. It's the idea of, and there in that word prowls is in the present tense. He's always doing this. He's never taking a day off. He's not thinking, well, it's Labor Day. I'll give him a day off of temptation. He's always at work. He's got boundless energy. Peter doesn't question the reality of Satan. He assumes it because Jesus didn't question the reality of Satan. He knew it. Look at verse 9. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. There's an understanding when I'm going through something hard that I should gain strength from knowing that other brothers and sisters and Christians in the world are going through hard things as well. And I want to stand strong for them as I'm praying that they stay strong for me. There's a family. What do you do to resist him? He says, you submit to God. You don't fight the devil. (laughs) You submit to God. You feeling spiritual warfare in your life? Are you submitting? Are you walking with him? Are you becoming a stray? Look at verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, establish you. There's an understanding that if you know there's an end to something, you can withstand anything. I think that's what Peter's saying. Look at verse 11. To him be the dominion forever forever. 
and ever. Amen. Uh, Satan is not a sovereign king. He is an imposter. And I love how Peter gets the end of the book and says, Jesus is in charge. <laughs> and then all he can say to it really is amen. Jesus is in charge. Amen. It's not Satan's dominion. It's his. How do you resist the devil? Submitting to God. He's the father of lies. He will lie to you. He will lie to you through Christian friends. He will lie to you through counselors. He can lie to you through your own interpretation of the word because you want it to say what you want it to say. He can lie to you through pastors. There are pastors preaching right now that I believe in the pulpits that are not Christians. I believe they went to seminaries that are not Christian. I believe they sat under teachers at seminaries that are not Christian. And he loves to bring these false teachers and these false Christians together. Whenever you have to create your own theology to justify your own actions, then you know you've been deceived. Jesus says, he who does not gather with me scatters. You know how you resist Satan? You get busy with building kingdom. That's how you resist Satan. I tell you, the temptation in my life goes so far down when I'm serving other people, when I'm sharing my faith, when I'm in my word. When you are doing what you're supposed to be doing, the roar of the lion just seems more and more faint. I'm not so much focused on what he may be thinking today. I'm thinking more about what God wants me to do today. Spending time in his word. Because I got to tell you, it's the most romantic, exhilarating, powerful thing to build kingdom. You're not in your Bible. You're surrendering. You're not praying daily. You're surrendering. Satan, here's my family. Go for it. Let stuff in your home. Here it is, Satan. Go for it. The Bible tells us that Jesus will crush Satan under his feet. The Bible gives us insider trading on the fact of who wins. Soldiers in war, they fight not knowing the outcome of the battle. We are soldiers of light. We fight knowing who wins. We can lay it all on the field, folks. We've got insider trading tips. And I don't know about you, but I'm putting all my chips on Jesus. <laughs> If I know I can't lose on investment, I'm selling everything I have and I'm putting all the chips on him. Because that is an investment that will return for eternity. Amen? Amen. The enemy's real. We have a helper. He empowers you. Do not empower the enemy. Submit to the helper. Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us, for your love for Austin Ridge. As I pray often, Father, as you know, I pray that I, my staff, elders, we wouldn't do anything stupid that would bring blasphemy to your name, blackness to the testimony of your gospel. I pray you protect us. And Father, there are folks in Building A and Building D on the Southwest Campus that right now there are things going on in their lives that they're throwing their life in the toilet, they're throwing it away. I pray that you'd grab their hearts today. I pray they'd see through the lies that ultimately whatever they think they're chasing that brings them more joy ultimately brings them the most destruction. That the father of lies is alive and active, but there is a helper. Father, no, no matter how long we've strayed from you, you are the good shepherd. And you will hold us again and you will carry us again and you will power us again because your love your grace is stronger than any enemy. So I lift up my friends today that are struggling. May we be men and women of truth. It's in your name we pray. Amen.